Yes. Yeah. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. And it's, it's a pleasure seeing you again, you know, for another monthly meeting of the Hong Kong Philatelic Society and the Hong Kong Study Circle, sponsored by <coughs> FIAT. Um, and it's good to see so many of you, uh, you, know, you know, coming to the, uh, the Zoom meeting. Um, the theme for this evening is actually uh, the Battle for Hong Kong and Japanese Occupation Part 1. Uh, is part one because I'm sure that there will be a lot of uh, things to, to be discussed by members and uh, a lot of members are interested in this particular topic and they probably will want to show after, after this uh, meeting. So that's why I designated this as part one and there's probably going to be a part two or, or even part three. But um, <clears throat> yeah, um, the main speaker, we've got three main speakers tonight uh, and uh, I think I'm going to introduce the first speaker who would like to start. Uh, it's it's uh, the Richard Rittington from the UK, and uh, he's going to talk about, uh, I think it's about censorship marks or something like that. Richard? Uh, detain, oh, detain, detain cover. Detain, yeah. detain cover, sorry. Yes, yes. So um, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing and and... Right, let me just stop. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this. Okay, and then uh, it's your turn. You're on the floor. The floor's yours. So if we could master the technology, I think. Okay. Well, I put the can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, uh my apologies. I'm a bit under the weather today, but hopefully nothing serious. So I better get on with this. Um, detain covers something I've been studying for a long time. And a while ago, I decided to write this up for the next uh, Philatelic Society journal. But COVID uh, set back me along with everybody else. And now, having spent almost one and a half years in virtual isolation, I thought I would take this opportunity to uh, at least put something down as a marker, who knows what tomorrow might bring. And then I still intend to do the article, so, and I would really welcome any feedback as we go along today or uh, in the future. I've not mentioned individuals in this, uh, in this um, presentation. I'm rather frightened to forget someone and, uh, um, but I think everyone knows who they are, the people who've helped me in this and other matters. I'm fortunate that I have so many friends and colleagues willing to help me. So anyway, let's go, detain covers. So this presentation only deals with covers um, that were detained in Hong Kong by the Japanese um, between December 1941 and August, actually, 1945. There are other similar types of hand stamps, but I think most of those, at least, if not all, were not applied in Hong Kong. It doesn't deal with POW or intern email, and also it does not deal with mail that was released, was detained, but released by the Japanese in 1942. I think Sam Chu is going to deal with those uh, later. Um, the presentation is based on an analysis of a database 
of recorded items, principally covers, outgoing covers, and scans of those covers that I've collected over the years with the help of many people. So many thanks again. Very much a work in progress, as I said, corrections, comments, suggestions, most welcome. So what, what is a detained cover or what I call a detained cover? Well, a detained cover always would feature the hand stamp detained in Hong Kong by the Japanese, December 41 to September 45. This hand stamp is found in violet, as shown here, and or in black. It may or may, emphasis on may, uh, also feature uh, in combination um, the retour hand stamp, which is found in black, which was probably struck at the GPO in December 41, and no service hand stamp found in violet, again, probably struck at the GPO at the same time, or but not necessarily by the same person. May also have evidence of attempts to return the item to the sender in December 1941. And it may also actually have an arrival date stamp when it was sent to the addressee in 1945. So more on each of these as we go along. I thought it would be useful to a brief timeline of what was going on at the end of 1941. It's only a, uh, certain events, not comprehensive. So starting at the top, on the 29th of November was the last outgoing surface mail to the USA and Canada on the Norwegian ship Cornerville. The following day was the last outgoing Pan Am flight by Hong Kong Clipper 2, uh, carrying mail to Manila for connection to the United States. The last Pan Am flight to leave Hong Kong was on the 3rd of December, but this was carrying mail to Manila for connection with the Pan Am service to Singapore. And on the same day, the 3rd of December, was the last outgoing um, surface mail by the ship Nellor to Australia. The 5th was the last CNA sea flight out by Rangoon to connect with BOAC services. And on the 6th and 7th was an exodus of shipping from Hong Kong, um, mainly uh, medium-sized shipping that escaped before the Japanese crossed the border and essentially embargoed Hong Kong to shipping on the 8th, as from the 8th and 9th. On the 8th of December, the Japanese army units crossed the border from Shenzhen into the new territories. And at eight o'clock in the morning, Japanese planes bombed Kaitak Aerodrome, where Hong Kong Clipper 2 was at its moorings and was destroyed. It was reported that the Pan Am sales manager actually rescued mail, um, which presumably was for Manila and Malaya, uh, as advertised from the bomb plane, but we have no known surviving covers. On the 9th of December, um, the last incoming flight carrying mail arrived shortly after midnight, i.e. the night of the 8th, morning of the 9th. It carried mail, and we have examples of those uh, detained but there was no outgoing mail as scheduled uh, on that return flight that only carried CNAC staff and other notable uh, people. On the 11th of December, 
Kowloon was evacuated and Kai Tak immobilized and completed on the 13th with troops deployed on Hong Kong Island. On the 18th, the Japanese commenced invasion of Hong Kong Island. And on the 25th, uh, the British uh, command surrendered, the governor surrendered. And that's it, in a nutshell. So the, the database that I have uh, consists of 170 individual items, 168 covers and two AR cards from all sorts of places and people. Generally, I've written down here a basic um, listing. 132 were from GPO, 16 from Kowloon, and then small number individual ones from certain branch offices, not all, few transit covers and so on. And the date ranges for the outgoing covers are shown there too. I think people can always have a look on YouTube or I can send, send it to anyone that's interested. So analyzing this a bit further, the summary of these ones, principally surface mail from the GPO. And out of these, there are many uh, Sea Force uh, detained covers by Sea Force. Of course, that's the Canadian troops who arrived in Hong Kong shortly before the Japanese. Um, many of those are date, dated 6th to 8th of uh, December. There are no known registered covers that uh, were detained or survived, should I say. Presumably, all of them were systematically looted by the Japanese. I'm going through the airmail covers, eastbound uh, airmail covers. There's 31 of them. There's a total of 46 airmail covers in the database. And they're spread across uh, primarily um, by a Pan Am in this one, going to America, Canada, Europe, UK actually. Um, and the date, the dates are there too. For westbound, rather less number and interestingly there are I think uh, that I know of there are no known covers detained to UK or Europe by either CNAC Rangoon route or by sea to Singapore and onward by air those would be the dollar fifty and the dollar fifteen uh, routes. And the only known $1.15 cover uh, is prob probably one, um, because there's one stamp floated off, um, was going to Australia on the 8th of December. Some observations on these uh, detained covers that went by air. The known covers to the Americas uh, are consistent with the Pan Am departure, the last one, on the 30th of November. Uh, the earliest recorded date was in Kowloon on the 29th, but it didn't get to the GPO until the 30th, didn't make the last line. The latest recorded dates for known covers via the USA is the 10th of December. This is a, perhaps a little bit surprising if the Hong Kong Clipper was destroyed on the 8th, but mail notices continued to appear in newspapers up to the 9th of December, which is the final one, uh, advertising mails by that route closing on the 10th of December. So therefore people still 
posted. The known covers via Rangoon are consistent with the last flight there. Um, as I said earlier, no known covers to the UK by air, but this may well have been because they were cleared and sent by surface uh, during Exodus on the 6th and 7th. No known uh, airmail covers to China. Uh, these probably released by the Japanese in 1942. Um, Sam will deal with those, as I said. The surface, the surface, sorry, the surface mail, there's a rather more eastbound. And as you can see, they're split between the USA and Canada. And there are a few uh, by sea to the UK and ERA. The reason that I put the UK ERA one here is that by the time that these covers were being posted, um, mails were sent via the USA, or they were sent uh, via the Panama Canal. Westbound route, a couple of covers by sea to India and to one to Africa. Tanganyika, I think, if I remember correctly. And southbound, there are 16 surface mail covers to Australia and New Zealand and Fiji, I think. So the observations on these. Uh, Surface mail ones, again, there's no known covers to Singapore, Malaya. Chinese ones, probably none, probably returned in 42. Um, and the USA, Canada ones are uh, consistent with the last sailing uh, by the Corneville. But it is a little bit strange that after the 29th of November, then no surface further surface mails were sent to the USA and Canada. Um, generally at that time, the Norwegian shipping line was running sort of like a monthly service or three weekly service. But the 29th of November one was the last one to go directly to Los Angeles and San Francisco. And subsequent ones, whether they notify post office or not, disappeared the other, in the other direction via the Cape uh, to America. Um, UK ones basically consistent. Covers to Australia, um, several covers on the fourth and fifth, which fits in with what I mentioned about the Nello leaving on the third. But again, it's a little bit strange that none were taken out by shipping uh, that left on the 6th and 7th of December. Most of that shipping went to uh, Manila, some to Singapore. Last known one, which is the one shown here, is uh, 11th of December to India. Um, I'm at a Bit of a loss to explain why uh, such a cover would exist uh, from the post office, handled by the post office at that time. I think the red note at the bottom is uh, happens a lot in this presentation. A lot more work needed. So now that's dealt with the covers that we that I know of, and now turning to certain features of these uh, detained covers. Uh, dealing first with the retour and no service hand stamps. Retour in black, no service in violet. And these only appear on detained covers with clear senders addresses, either business, personal or GPO box. 
They are both Hong Kong markings. There's some conjecture about whether they were or not. In my opinion, they are, and they are not by the Japanese. Though Simon will deal with these hand stamps in more detail later, I believe. Um, I would just like to explain why I think that. So, well, number one, not all of the detained covers have these markings, as I just mentioned. Retour is a hand stamp used to return uh, mail for what for some reason to the sender. And that's only possible to do that in December 41. Also, these, these markings also appear in transit mails originating from China, which were returned by the Japanese in 1942. So they would not have appeared on these covers in 1942 if it had been anywhere else other than Hong Kong. And furthermore, the Japanese crossed out the retour and no service markings. Um, why would they do that unless they were there before they handled them? Logically, covers were stamped when it was clear that no more males uh, were going to leave uh, due to Japanese invasion and also um, sabotage was perhaps the, not the right word, Dem um, putting out commission of Kaitang by the British. And the, the service, no service and retour was probably done at some time after the 10th of December at 12.30, because there is a known cover uh, with these details, which not only had the retour and no service hand stamp, but there was an also an attempt to return it to the sender. The question that I have, an open question, is why are these in different colors? I'm not entirely sure of the answer to that. Moving on, then there were attempts made to return some of these detained covers. Generally speaking, with the emphasis on generally, uh, an attempt was made to return items to senders locally in Hong Kong and Kowloon. Um, by the British postal authorities in December 1941, but only in cases where a sender's address was clearly evident and not to GPO boxes. You'll recall that the no service and return markings included GPO boxes. So at that point, the intention may have been to try and return things through GPO boxes, but there's no evidence of that happening. Attempts to return it um, when they failed uh, is evidenced by certain Chinese characters in crayon, usually stating moved house with the sender's address crossed through. There are a number of examples using similar, which are abbreviated form of Chinese characters, which suggest that they were written by staff at the PO, and perhaps not by local delivery postmen. Three, you can see on this slide, there are four uh, character sets. Uh, which are basically the same, probably written by the same hand. Furthermore, there's an example which I'll show later on a Kowloon cover, which has removed in English, um, which supports this theory also. The head 
Clark, uh, Kowloon was an English speaking man, David Fernandez. That's not to say that there aren't, there aren't other markings of a similar nature. This needs to be investigated further. And as I mentioned, the top right hand one is from the cover of 10th of December, suggesting that an attempt was made after 12.30 p.m. on the 10th to return it to the sender. In some cases, we've seen and recorded a chop that was used um, on some covers. I'm aware of seven of these covers with this chop. Three of them were to a firm called Davy Boank, which was in the Charter Bank building, and then a couple of other ones in St. George's building. Um, and then there's one to New Zealand Insurance Company and one to Kowloon Dock. I'm not sure where they were addressed. Maybe Kowloon Dock had a central office. But there are several detained covers where attempts were made to deliver it to the same area, Charter Bank building, including one to David Boag, actually, and the area, immediate area. Um, there's no evidence of any attempt to return covers with this chop. There's no, there, none of the addresses have crossed out and there's no Chinese characters apart from the chop. They are, they are from different senders. So it's not a private chop. And it's always found in uh, black ink. So the thought, thought is that this chop was used at the GPO in cases where it was known or they were informed that the business was no longer at its registered address. This chop was applied at some time after general stamping and retour and no service, some time after the 9th of December. Turning to the mainland, Kowloon Post Office, total of 19 detained covers, most of which had no return, return or no, no service. Um, mainly because they didn't have addresses on them. And out of these, uh, only four were attempted to be re-delivered or delivered back to the sender. And all of them also have Japanese uh, postal markings. In other words, they were abandoned. Of these four covers, three of them were at Kowloon and one was a Kowloon Tom cover. Um, generally speaking, the, uh, everyone followed the GPO guideline or pros, procedure in trying to uh, get these covers back, if possible or sensible. All four have uh, unsuccessful attempts or evidence of unsuccessful attempts to return them to senders, and they were also all subsequently handled by the Japanese Kowloon Post Office. Presumably, all four covers were then added to the seven bags, famous seven bags, recovered in September 1945, at some point during the Japanese occupation. First cover, the details are here. Um, I won't just read it out. But essentially, these covers had Japanese uh, 
markings. The, the uh, um, characters, uh, I'm led to believe, uh, indicate that they were written by uh, Chinese. But of course, the Japanese Kowloon Post Office stamp is there to be seen. This one's 10th of February. This one, the 11th of February, with a, a different um, characters on it. <coughs> Sorry. This is the Kowloon Tongue one. Um, and you can see the address crossed out. Um, can be returned. Third one, again, uh, from Callum YMCA, is on. And uh, reference to the second district office. And Again, this one is the 11th. And then my favorite one is next. This is a W.E. Jones. I think we all know who W.E. Jones was. It's a W.E. Jones cover. And is, I, am, I think, the latest date from Kowloon Post Office before the occupation. on the 9th of December, uh, PM, I'm not quite sure of the time. And it went from Kowloon on the 9th, which was the day after Kai Taket was bombed and the troop, Japanese troops started, sorry, started uh, coming over the border. And it was returned to, uh, sent over to the GPO uh, with a date stamp of 4.30 PM. And then subsequently sent uh, where it was stamped with the return and no service, and then sent back to Kowloon uh, to attempt to return it to Mr. Jones. It's so unsuccessful, and you can see on the reverse of the cover in red, the address crossed out and English removed. And the characters on this, this one, again, refer to the second district office, um, Japanese office. Again, 11th of February, 42, Kowloon Post Office. I think the Japanese reopened the Kowloon Post Office in January, 22nd of January, 1942. So some observations on these covers, they followed the same procedures, attempts were made, addresses were crossed out, unsuccessful attempts. And there are no known covers where an attempt was made to return it to a Kowloon center that were not subsequently handled at the Japanese Kowloon post office. The second district office, the Japanese administrative office, is a, I understand was in the Peninsula Hotel building. Uh, it was renamed by the Japanese. And that office closed down at some point, and then all uh, administrative affairs are definitely associated with so called enemy uh, males. P and POW mails and everything else seems to have been handled uh, at the main office, which was located in the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank building in Central. The th thought, or my thought, is that at some point these four covers were sent over 
from Kowloon to the Japanese administrative office in Central and uh, ended up in the Seven Bags. Slightly querisome is the different, differing handwritten notes on these uh, four items. And perhaps someone could enlighten me a bit on that side of things. So that was, was in 1941. So these covers then feature again in 1945 when the colony was liberated. And again, here is a short timeline, which people may not be so familiar with some of these things. Uh, on the 20th of August, Mr. Wynn. My daughter is trying to get a hold of me, sorry. Sorry. Win Jones uh, was appointed. Um, he was in Stanley uh, camp. And once the, to, the Japanese had surrendered, uh, which was, I think, around about 15th or 16th of August, then it was agreed between the British internees, led by uh, Grimson, who was the colonial secretary uh, before Japanese occupation, uh, that senior members of the old government, so department heads, things like that, would be allowed to monitor what was going on with their opposite numbers in the Japanese administration to make sure that things were not uh, sabotaged or messed up. This was agreed. And on the 20th of August, Wynne Jones was uh, nominated to look after the communications, including the postal system. It's not surprising he was the PMG uh, when the Japanese uh, invaded. And on the 27th, he moved into town from Stanley. And he confirmed that uh, there was no mail at the GPO uh, on the 27th. No mail from before the invasion. And in the afternoon of the 27th, uh, British officers, PO, ex POWs, um, brought back seven mailbags from the Japanese Foreign Affairs Bureau, which was located in the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. These are the seven bags referred to by Webb and so on, but they weren't in the post office. On the 30th of August, uh, Harcourt's task group entered Hong Kong Harbor. They landed initially clearing out the dockyard area in Wan Chai. On that day, Japanese uh, staff left the GPO and Wynne Jones had the premises secured and closed down. 1st of September, BMA was established, British Military Administration. And the 5th of September, GPO and Kowloon Post office reopened for free local mail only. The initial problem in those days, the reason it was free, uh, was primarily associated with currency. There was no currency in Hong Kong apart from the Japanese, which they didn't want to use. 6th of September, Wynne Jones was appointed controller of communications. Um, and the Central Executive Branch, BMA, was officially established on the 11th. 
Wynne Jones and Samuel Randall, who was in uh, control of posts, uh, departed uh, for Manila, Singapore and Colombo on the repatriation ship Empress of Australia. And the detained covers, it seems, also went on that ship. 13th, the day after, John Lee was appointed in place of Win Jones, and then 16th, the surrender of the Japanese was formalized at Government House. So the discovery of the detained covers is not as previously published. They were not found in the GPO. They were found in the Japanese office, the Foreign Affairs Bureau in the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank building on the 27th. Turning to the detained hamstam itself, this is found in violet and black, two different colors associated with the routing to be used to forward individual covers to the original addressees. Black ink was used for covers addressed to the USA and Canada, irrespective of by air or surface, and purple ink was used for other locations, Australia, New Zealand, India, and Great Britain. All the covers were sent initially from Hong Kong by surface. And then because of the clarity of the detained cover strikes and the lack of any fusing of black and purple, it seems reasonable to assume that more than one hand stamp was used. The other, well, for me, an interesting fact is that actually this detained hand stamp is factually incorrect because the Japanese did not detain mail beyond August 1945 and not September 1945 as stated on the hand stamp. Arguably, this error suggests that the wooden hand stamps were manufactured and also used in September 1945. There's a matter of argument about that. So the dispatch of these detained covers back uh, or to the addressees, uh, there was a rather inaccurate article in the China Mail on the 11th of September 45, which was the first post-war edition which referred to seven bags of mail posted on 23, 24 and 26 December 1941. Wrong. Um, it says there there was a wooden chop procured by Wynne Jones and that they were dispatched by the Empress of Australia, which left harbour yesterday. So that would have been the 10th. Again, that date is not strictly correct as the Empress of Australia departed Hong Kong waters on the 12th of September. But this confusion may, may well have been associated with passengers, um, PO, uh, internees and POWs being picked up at various points around in Hong Kong waters. Wynne Jones uh, was listed as a passenger on the Empress, as was Samuel Randall. Um, thanks to the Imperial War Museum, we have a photograph of the ship in uh, Hong Kong Harbour with Wan Chai in the background. And uh, I managed to get hold a while ago of the ship's log for the Empress of Australia, 
which arrived with the shield convoy, but this brought troops, RAF, um, and so on, uh, arriving on the 4th of September. And it then departed on the 12th from Hong Kong, and then Manila arrived, departed, then to Singapore, Colombo, uh, Aden, Gibraltar, and uh, arrived in Liverpool on the 27th of October, 1945. Initially, it carried 900 POWs and 1,000 civilian internees. And the arrival or, or forwarded dates that I know of um, for detained covers with violent handstands uh, I've listed. To India, I, I know of four, but with received dates of 8th and 9th of October. And this is consistent with the arrival of Empress of Australia at Colombo on the 2nd of October. Covers to Burma arrived there much later, which is I'm not able to explain that, but it must, they must have been held at Colombo or India, I think. There are two covers to Melbourne. One was received on the 25th and the other was redirected with the Melbourne date stamp of the 26th of October. And these were likely to have been carried by the hospital ship Mananda which arrived on the 24th at Melbourne from Singapore, where it arrived on the 30th of September. And that ties in with the Empress of Australia being there uh, on the 24th. There's one cover with a receiver of 12th of November to New Zealand. That was probably forwarded from uh, Sydney. Um, we have three covers that I know of to uh, England. And these caused me some disquiet and took up a very large amount of time uh, on my part. But anyway, the point is that the Empress of Australia arrived at Liverpool on the 27th, and it seems that it did not stop at any other port in the UK. And the covers arrived before the Empress of Australia, basically. So the Empress of Australia, in mo most likelihood, did not carry these covers. So how did they get there? And the only thing that I've been able to come up with is that they did not leave Hong Kong on the Empress of Australia. They actually departed on the Glengyle, which also carried uh, British and um, troops. Um, which left on the 18th of September, which was six days after the Empress of Australia. And we know that the personnel were then transferred to the P&O steamer at Colombo, and this was Orduna. And my opinion, it was the Orduna which brought these covers into the UK. She arrived at Liverpool on the 19th of September, the day before the first receiving uh, in Birmingham. We also have one from Jamaica, which was received there on the 27th of October, and this may well have been forwarded from England. For the covers to the USA and Canada, and there are quite a number uh, which I have listed there, four to the USA and 10 to Canada. And the dates of these uh, indicate that 
there are at least two separate mails to Canada. The first one arriving on or about the 24th of September and the second on or about the 4th of October. As the Empress of Australia birthed at Manila on the 13th of September, then these were probably sent by air. And similarly for the first mail to the USA, which arrived on the 26th of September. But the later one, some 24th of October, may well have been sent by ship. As I mentioned earlier, all of these ones with black hand stamps, detained hand stamps, went to USA and Canada. And it's probable that these were the ones that were offloaded at Manila. All the other ones were not. Thus, violet hand stamps. And just some observations on this. The two different colors. Mails, uh, covers for USA, Canada were offloaded in Manila and then forwarded by air or surface. The 10 covers for Australia went to Singapore on the Empress, um, probably from there by hospital ship Mananda. To India, they were offloaded at Colombo from the Empress of Australia. And um, the odd man out, I think, uh, the detained covers for the UK, which uh, may very well not have arrived on the Empress of Australia, but rather on the Orduna, as I mentioned earlier. But a lot more work needed. Uh, as I said at the beginning, quite a lot of my work on this has been hampered uh, magnificently by uh, COVID. Uh, just my own uh, whimsical uh, concluding remarks. I'd like to emphasize that this is very much a work in progress and it's not complete, or, and I'm not suggesting that it's totally accurate, but hopefully it's a useful update on previously published information. I'm always thinking whenever I do things like this of Mr. Einstein, only for his words, not for any other reason. Uh, uh, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know, which is very true for all of us, I think. And thanks again to all those either listening in or absent who've helped me many ways with this and other projects, some of which are completed and others that I'm still working on. And thanks also to InterAsia of the past and Jumbo and the Imperial War Museum. So that is it. Thank Sorry to take you. so long. Thank you, Richard. I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, everybody feel that your presentation is absolutely fantastic and really has dispelled a lot of uh, errors uh, quoted by the previous uh, uh, students of, uh, you know, like, like Webb and Proud. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I really, it's, it's amazing just to, to, you worked it out that, uh, you know, the, the, the different color hand stamps uh, going to different places, and uh, I just wonder how many of those covers you own. I have, I don't own any. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. <laughs> As you know, that those covers are, are not cheap <laughs> by today's standard, even by today's standard. Uh, That's and, why. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Be but I know a lot of I know a lot of people who do, so I'm <laughs> eternally grateful to them, and I wouldn't be yeah. able to do. That without them. Uh, that, that's the beauty of research and you don't have to to uh, to own anything but just to to have just have the scans and in your computer and then you can actually work out something thank you very very much uh, richard and before we move on to the next speaker um uh, does anybody got any questions for richard yes i i, I do and uh, i really appreciated this uh, brilliant presentation i have two two uh, simple questions we are talking about seven bags of mail. 
Do we have an idea of how many mail was in those bags? In other words, how many total cover may have existed? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, Billy, but I would think seven bags must be several thousand letters. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, okay. That's a lot of them. So uh, very few have been recovered, in other words. Correct. Uh, yeah. Now, I have another question. You're talking about the those return cover. So what you have identified are return covers that failed, but it may have been some return covers that were successfully returned. If it is the case, we would have a cover which does not have the detain in Hong Kong shop, but which would have the uh, no service and return and re retour Sure. Exactly. Exactly. I should have. I should have. I should have mentioned that. I, I wrote down in my notes that what we need are some covers with return and no service that actually were returned, so they were not that, returned. That was exactly. my question. Have we ever exactly. seen such a cover? Anyone have ever seen such a cover? I have not. No. But I'm. I'm sure that one or a few exist, I'm sure. So it is something to look for? Yes. <laughs> OK. For sure. <laughs> just, just on that point, if the cover was successfully returned, then it won't have the detained marking on it, will it? Exactly, Frank, yes, yes. It would have, it would have the retour. It would have the no service. And that would be it, I think. And of course, it would it would have to have uh, date stamps that were that fitted in with the general uh, lack of mail, outgoing mails from Hong Kong. But yeah, I've Hopefully also somebody, got two. Uh, got one. <laughs> sorry, I've also got two detained covers to Australia. Would you like scans of them, Richard? I would love them, yes. Yeah, yes. okay, I'll get yes. them done over the next few days. That would be marvellous. Thanks, Frank. Do they, do they have, uh, do they have uh, delivery stamps on them, or you're not sure? Uh, there's some other, there are some Australian markings on them. Oh, cool. Interesting. Thank you. Richard, it's Ingo here. Um, yep. In terms of the exotic destinations like the West Indies, I think you showed that there were two, one yeah. to Jamaica. Um, I saw one a, a number of years ago. There was one um, offered locally here in Toronto going to Trinidad. Yes, um, I've got that. Like, yeah, you I got, got that. that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, well, I think I, I think I do. I do have one to Trinidad. Yeah. Um, okay. And funnily enough, the Trinidad, uh, hopefully I get this right, the Trinidad one has the detained in black and the Jamaica one has the detained in violet. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I tried to acquire that one, but the seller had a buyer who gave a sort of, I'll pay whatever it costs price, so I couldn't get it. Yeah. I mean, if uh, one or two of the covers in the uh, database actually have the wrong colored detained stamp on them. So if you find any of those in your collection, I suggest you hop off down to the, the Royal and make sure it's certified. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point, because these are now somewhat known, and I'm sure there's uh, some very creative people trying to make a buck. Absolutely. Over the years, yeah. I was curious, uh, Richard, when uh, the Japanese started taking care of the post office, the did they bring in staff to man all the points or did they supervise uh, Hong Kong post office staff? 
I think the postmaster, postmasters, I think uh, John Tang and Simon or, or Sam may correct me, but I think that the postmaster, for example, at Kowloon was Japanese, but his staff was uh, local. Some of whom, some of whom uh, uh, worked in the post office under the British beforehand. Yeah, I, I suppose um, most of the uh, post office staff uh, working under Japanese administration were the uh, previous postal staff uh, working under the Hong Kong administration. Most of them. Thank you. In fact, in fact, when when um, uh, in 1945, one of the superintendents, I think it was uh, Fitches, was actually sent into the town to round up as many of the old post office staff that he could find. And, and I think there were not a huge number of them. Okay, any further questions for Richard? Uh, okay, uh, Richard, I have just uh, two remarks uh, regarding, um, uh, in fact, this remark uh, in fact, uh, is suggested by John Tan, and uh, it's about the, the uh, Chinese character instructional chop uh, closed down for business, one by Kitty. And in fact, that chop uh, was uh, uh, used by the Japanese administration. And uh, so uh, the attempt uh, to return or uh, retour those mails, uh, 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 that trop uh, should be uh, during the, the Japanese uh, occupation time. Uh, this is the first point. Uh, the second point uh, I would like to make is about um, the uh, purpose with no service and retour, but not detained. And in fact, there exists a few purpose there. And, uh, I will have those uh, illustrated uh, in my presentation. Great, great. Uh, say again, why, why do you think that the, the chop was applied by the Japanese? Um, can I show you uh, uh, two, two images? Sure. Uh, yeah. Just a quick uh, sharing of, uh, yeah. This one, obviously, during the uh, Japanese occupation. Yeah, sure. Right, and uh, another one. Uh, yeah, this one again. Yep. Okay. But um, I wonder whether in fact this was uh, unlike other chops mm. uh, which were in English mm. whether this chop was actually used by the British and Japanese yes, yes. Mm. Well, okay. because okay. it doesn't it doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me mm. that a few covers have it on um, which fit into the British shop uh, category, and also you also quite clearly have shown uh, it also used on some Japanese occupation covers. So I wonder whether, because it because it was in uh, Chinese characters, it may have been uh, used by the Japanese. As well as the British. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's possible, but uh, I, I, I believe uh, those chops uh, on detained covers uh, were used by Japanese. In, in fact, I, I will cover that topic a little bit uh, when, uh, in my presentation. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, if there are no further questions for Richard, um, uh, can we move on to the next uh, presenter, Sam, from Canada? Right, Sam, all yours.
We have two Hi. Sams on the thing. Two Sams, yeah. Ah, and he's using two computers. <laughs> two for the price of one. No, I just have a new computer, and then the one the doesn't have a camera yet. So, but I'm going to use that as the uh, as uh, sharing. So, okay, I'm going to share screen now. Okay, so Richard asked me to um, to show this particular topic. And uh, again, as a disclaimer, I only have a few. So, I mean, the credit, uh, if I could claim a credit is that I'm the first guy who used the term U-turn cover, as you see. So uh, we're going through to go through why there's existence of U-turn covers. There's other people who have mentioned this, but nobody um, came up with the reason until I did. So, so the whole idea was there's a bunch of covers that originated from China and uh, they could be air mail, they could be service mail. And then if it's service mail or even sometimes air mail, it would have gone through this secret Canton sorting office, which is called Sa Yu Chong. But at the time uh, that the covers were trapped, Sa Yu Chong was not in operations by then. If it's airmail, it would have came through from Chongqing to Kuilin. So after the war, after the fighting in February, we found a bunch of covers. I mean, the, the U-turn covers, my guess is the existence is probably, oh, several hundred. It's just people, I, I, it seems like every other person I know have one or two, it, they were able to identify all because of the return date on the, the Canton uh, receiver after the war. So, okay, so in uh, 1998, I wrote an article detained in Hong Kong and it's, uh, and I call those the, the U-turn covers. Now, the reason I call it U-turn, well, I've explained that to you. And uh, after the fact, they award this as the best article of the year for 1998. So, and then subsequently in the Hong Kong PS Journal, I wrote a follow-up article. So of course I was still learning. And now thank God to, uh, you know, not thank God, but thank Richard. So that would clear up a lot of my mistakes. So, so um, the, the observation were there was a whole bunch of Chinese cover that originated from China that got turned back. And the, there is a reason behind this, which uh, other writers weren't able to associate. It was because of the fact that the Japanese created this uh, Far East coal prosperity circle and whoever members of that including China and we'll see as well Thailand as well uh, that all the mail from those countries the franking as long as the stamps are from there they are treated as friendly and after the fighting they were redirected back to their country well where it originated from so while the other from the so-called enemy countries, the Hong Kong stamps, the Burma stamps, because of the, the British association, they were whole in Hong Kong and they were the detained covers. So one of the earliest record that I have is October 8. So you can see this is two months before the actual fighting. So this particular cover, the, the, the you know, from, from Fujian. So I, uh, the whole explanation why it took so long, because uh, un unfortunately on the back, half the cover is ripped off, but fortunately it has half a Canton receiver on it. So I cannot see what the uh, Hong Kong date is. 
And also, this is a printed matter. I'm not sure if it actually has a Hong Kong arrival date. However, it took a long time to get to uh, get to Hong Kong first, and then because, as Richard have said, the uh, the eastbound ship have sailed on November 29th, it probably missed that ship. And uh, even though it doesn't have an arrival, it looks like it did went to the U.S. because there's directional markings on the front saying that person after the war, or not after the war, but after probably sometimes in 1942 or for even 43, as we could see from other examples, that the person received it. Okay, so this is another one from Fru Jen. Now this is a whole month later, November 17th. Now you can see the strikes on the back. It arrived December the 1st in Hong Kong, missing the, uh, this is missing the, uh, the 29th of November, last eastbound uh, ship going. So on the back, you could see the, uh, the February 13th. By the way, February 13th is the earliest recorded. So far, I've only seen two covers with the fe fe February 13 date. Most of the covers were sent back and received in Kandon half the February 14th date. So as you can see again from uh, the, the typical detained cover, it has all the markings. The detour in black, cross out in red. The no surface in violet, cross out in red. So this, this has the email cross out because you know you look at the dollar twenty five. It was from supposedly airmail to Hong Kong only, and on arrival in Hong Kong, it would have crossed out. It would have then go by you know as as it is clearly said that airmail to Hong Kong via Kukang, and then you know. So this, the, the date you know, initially is November seventeenth. You would figure if it's airmail. It took something like, you know, two weeks to go got to get to Hong Kong from airmail. Obviously, it was trying to hide from the Japanese, and it's even doubtful if it was flown from Kukong or it went through the Canton shipping office. And with, that's why it took, you know, two months, uh, two weeks just to get to Hong Kong. So, it uh, unfortunately this did not have the uh, arrival marking in the US. So again, on arrival in US, the person has moved. So that's an indication that, you know, a long time have passed before this was uh, received in, uh, in the US. So this is the, the, the typical 13. So this is another earlier marking, the uh, February 13 marking. Uh, this substantiate one of my the, the theory, and uh, it wasn't that common to find a detained a, a U-turn cover that was to other friendly country, and this is one example. As we already know, Thailand is part of this, you know, Far East Coast prosperity circle. Uh, as a matter of fact. Thailand got hold of four Malayan states during the Japanese occupation as well. So they were treated as friendly. So this particular cover came to Hong Kong and uh, it, it, the Hong Kong censor tape uh, arrival marking December the 1st and afterwards it was returned. So unfortunately, you know, the, the there is no other uh, marking on it, but we know it was returned. This actually came with a letter. So I'm fortunate to have, you know, all of that. Another return cover. Now this is getting closer to the invasion date, November 27th on Gongshu. 
Again, you could see the no service, the retour, cross out. Uh, again, this cover was flown, this flown into Hong Kong, which uh, it has a December 7 marking and the, uh, the Jesco marking blocking the airmail. And uh, it have a handwritten message that was received in California in January, 1943. So another year, it took a year to get to return back to uh, Canton, the, the February 14 date, the second earliest date known. So one, the last cover that I have is this particular cover. So this, this was the one that's the, the latest record. This came into Hong Kong, as Richard have said, this is probably, this was on the last flight. There was, this flight happened after the invasion started. So I entered this plus the other cover. Both of them show that there was one flight after the Japanese occupation, uh, Japanese invasion that brought mail in from Chongqing. It was flown into Hong Kong. So this has, again, the no service retour. Uh, if you take a look at the markings on the side, which is reproduced on the back, it was sent uh, on December 8th, so at 10 a.m. December 8th at 10 a.m., the Japanese have bombed uh, Kai Tak already. And uh, it has the no service retour cross out. So, so I, I don't have many answers, but a whole bunch of questions. So, and uh, Simon and, uh, you know, Richard already, uh, Simon will talk about this. So my questions are still, uh, when was the no service, when and where, you know, and who else could have done it? Besides, if, if it wasn't done by the British administ Postal Administration, who else? What about the retour marking? Again, it was, uh, was it done in GPO? Who else could do that? Uh, the third part is who start to cross out those markings? And uh, when, where and when were the mail, the U-turn covers, uh, handled and returned to Hong Kong. And uh, this where and when is, you, you could easily see it probably was done by the Japanese. Of course, we don't have any proof. So, you know, until we get proof, that's still a question. And of course, it probably was done after fighting where the Japanese got hold of the other mail and tried to loot the other mail. So then the very last question was, uh, was it done at the same time, i.e., what do you mean done at the same time? The determination of what to detain and what to return, was it done at the same location by the Japanese? It seemed to indicate so, but those are questions that we still need to answer. For, so for equal time, you know, any academic could argue about you know, my observation. After I wrote an article, there's this Hong Kong expert called Jack Yao. And so he wrote a rebuttal. So he, he came three points and then he had three assumptions. So, and I'm just gonna read it and I'm not gonna comment on it. So if he's, he claimed it is a common practice for Hong Kong PO to apply no service on all late mail. He explained that by late, it means that those international mail that missed the outbound boat. So no service really means late. Second point, the late mail will always be returned to the sender. If the sender cannot be located, then the Chinese marking closed down for business will be put on the envelope. Third point, Cover receives the no service marking will be marked retour for different for delivery via a different route. He made three more assumptions. The no service marking 
was applied to the late mail for the following reason. The late mail were waiting for the next outbound ships, but because of the outbreak of the war, no outbound service were available. So this marking was used. Second point, the retool marking was applied to the covers, which passed the Japanese military censorship following the occupation. Cover with this marking then being sent back to Canton before forwarded using alternate route. And last but not least, all other mail which did not pass the censorship, I guess he meant Japanese, were kept in the Hong Kong PO until the end of the war, then marked as the detained. Richard asked me to go the high road and don't comment on this. So, so I do have several friends who own U-turn covers and uh, because they have passed away and they gave me this information so I could show that to you. So here's another cover. The, uh, the one on the left is November 26th from Hanyang. So, and it has the AV2 marking. Again, it has the retour and uh, I think you could see the uh, no surface marking and it's crossed out. I don't have the original uh, cover in color. Another one, again from Han Yang as well, from the same correspondent the next day, it has the, uh, the retour marking and uh, you know both of them have the February 14 days. So after the fighting, this was returned. This belonged to uh, the late Steve Gates who, uh, who at one point works for um, Mike Rogers. So uh, another friend of mine, J. Lewis Blackburn, he was the, uh, the late um, CSS president. So he is an expert in collecting the Canton Sorting Office. And he was the one who alerted me to look for the, the Canton Sorting Office markings. So this is two covers that he has. Now, when his material was available for sale, I went down to the auctioneer and spent two days just photocopying the lots. So I have, um, you know, the other thing was that I gave him a couple of covers. So I was trying to buy it back, but I couldn't find those. Anyway, 1941, this is early. This is October 13 from Putin again. Again, from the Fukien area. So my earlier one was October the 8th. So there was a major problem for those uh, provinces that were located on the, the east side of Hong Kong to, to uh, transfer mail into Hong Kong. So it got into Hong Kong December the second. Again, it took like over, you know, not quite two months to get there. Another one where it was from Yunnan Fu, which is, you know, the, the extreme, the West End, and it says airmail to, uh, to, to Hong Kong and so on. 1129, so, so this particular cover was actually flown because from 1129 from Yunnan, it would have gone to Chongqing and then it would arrive in the Hong Kong in December the 2nd. Now the strange one with this is that it has all the, the, the telltale sign that this was a U-turn cover. What is missing is the Canton date, the Canton data of February 14 or 13. So, this is last of you know, his covers though. Again, October 30th from Fuxing again in Fukien province. Another example, how long it took, you know, and again, it came into Hong Kong December the 2nd. It did get the, uh, the Canton strike of February 13th. So those are my reports. There's probably hundreds more of U-turn covers, which at this point in time, I cannot afford anymore. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Sam, uh, for such a detailed presentation. And um, do we have any questions for Sam? Anybody? Anybody wish to ask any questions or comments on uh, Sam's presentation before we move on to the next presenter? Okay, so um, if that's the case, uh, the next presentation will come from Simon Choi of Hong Kong. Uh, Simon? Okay, yeah, uh, let me share the screen. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll talk about the retour and low service markets. Okay, in, in fact, um, in uh, the Tech Society Journal number six, published in 2002, uh, me and John uh, has uh, written an article uh, about the low service and retour market. And uh, that article uh, uh, was basically uh, uh, based on a, a cover um, with that two markings. And uh, this presentation is about to uh, revisit or update uh, the usage of those markings. And uh, before I move on, I would like to uh, make a special thanks to John Tang for his general support uh, for allowing me to use his uh, images uh, from his uh, collection. And of course, all those others who have helped me to and provide me with the information. Okay, uh, early usage of, of the two markings. Uh, in, in fact, uh, there exist a few covers. Uh, uh, most of them, or basically all of them, uh, sent from uh, Eastern America. Uh, and, and, and most of them are uh, uh, were from New York to Athens or, or, or Greece. And uh, uh, the illustrated uh, cover here is uh, uh, from uh, New York to Athens and then uh, transiting Hong Kong on March and uh, went on uh, by uh, the UAC as opposed uh, to Cairo. Uh, but that cover was returned probably due to um, the suspension of service uh, from Egypt to Greece. And then um, the, the Egyptian post office uh, returned that letter to Hong Kong, uh, where low surface was applied uh, uh, during the second transit. And then uh, the, the retour marking was made by the return letter office on August 30, uh, for return to the country of origin, uh, which is US. And uh, other similar couples uh, uh, have been recorded and, and the return letter office uh, 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 day stamps are uh, in fact uh, uh, August 30th, uh, September 1st, and September uh, 10th. Uh, most other covers having the low surface and retour markings uh, are associated with the Battle of Hong Kong, uh, which uh, lead to the suspension of postal routes uh, uh, from late November to December of 1941. And uh, uh, further to that article uh, in journal number six, uh, in, in fact, uh, I, I, I myself uh, was thinking about the unanswered questions uh, all the time uh, because I suppose the puzzle was still not solved, uh, especially on the when, uh, I mean, in the which time period and why, uh, under what circumstances, uh, circumstances were that two markings applied and uh, what has actually ha happened to the postal operations and how those mails were handled uh, during that time. And uh, I, I noticed that uh, different suggestions uh, have been made by various specialists, but uh, to me, uh, none of them are, are convincing enough to explain all related covers. Okay, um, let's uh, start with uh, uh, one category of covers with low, versus, with low surface and mature markings. And in fact, uh, that category are, are, are incoming emails from China transiting Hong Kong and then Sam choose a term of the U-turn covers. And uh, they were trapped by the war in December and then uh, returned to Canton in February of 1942 uh, before forwarding to the destinations in the US. And this is one of the example. And the date of the Canton chop uh, was the uh, 13th of February, 1942. 
and then the second category uh, of males having that two markings uh, are, are outgoing males with uh, different routes and destinations, C or air males. And uh, with my uh, just simple calculation uh, of a limited uh, database, uh, I uh, found out that around 40% of detained couples are having uh, that two markings. And uh, as uh, Richard mentioned, apparently there uh, was no criteria for applying those two markings uh, just on males market clearly with the sender or return address. Uh, but not all the males are having such a return or sender address like the one on the right, uh, uh, like, like the, the couple on the right. False males. Uh, in fact, most false males do not have the no surface and ritual markings uh, simply because most of them do not have a sender return address. Uh, I don't know why they, 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 the, 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 the uh, uh, sender just uh, uh, wrote down the name and, and this army unit on, on, on the uh, letters or couples, like this one illustrated here. Uh, but there exist a few exceptions, and I will uh, deal with them uh, later. Were, uh, when were the two markings applied? Uh, I will uh, separate uh, that time period in, into three periods. Uh, period number one. Uh, 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 okay, and then step uh, mails with the two markings for day stamp between uh, 29th of November and, and, and 9th of December, maybe my record uh, is not very updated, that may depend on uh, December, uh, as uh, I recall of what uh, Richard uh, was told uh, uh, earlier. And, uh, but the latest day of uh, the detained cover uh, was posted on the 11th of December, uh, uh, that OHMS mail to Calcutta, and that cover is not having any, is, is without the uh, no surface and ritual markings. So the first period uh, immediately following the collection and cancellation of mails, I, in my opinion, is unlikely. Uh, despite the anticipation of a coming war, I suppose the post office could not foresee in advance that the Japanese would, have, would start the attack on December the 8th and subsequently all mail was, uh, were suspended and interrupted. And after the Clipper departed Hong Kong uh, on 30th of November. In fact, another flight was scheduled, uh, I, I suppose, one week later, approximately. And the mail uh, on the left, uh, I, I am illustrating, uh, was postmarked 5th of December. Uh, this mail was probably sorted and put in the mail bag awaiting for the next uh, Clipper flight. Unfortunately, unfortunately that uh, Clipper number. Clipper two airplane was bombed and destroyed by Japanese on the eighth. The second period uh, between eighth of December, uh, when the war uh, uh, has been started, and the surrender of Hong Kong uh, on twenty fifth. Um, this period, I believe, is possible but doubtful. Uh, why I'm saying that? Let's uh, look at uh, an extract of an article. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, it is in Chinese uh, because uh, uh, it is from a CPA newsletter in June 1999. But uh, I have uh, translated some main points here. Uh, in, in fact, uh, that article uh, was a recall or oral history from uh, the superintendent of Post uh, in 1941, uh, his name uh, uh, is Low Pat White. And, uh, and, and Mr. Low, uh, in fact, uh, uh, is the uncle of, of the author of the article, uh, Choi Guang Peng. And he mentioned that uh, the post office was in normal operation uh, in the morning of 8th of December. And then an emergency meeting was held at around 10 a.m. in the PNG room. And the PNG made uh, the following announcements. Uh, British will soon announce war with Japan. Uh, post operations will stop immediately. All post office staff will be dismissed and their salaries will be distributed by the, by the responsible branches on next day morning. 
And then the meeting attendees, uh, most uh, uh, all of them are uh, in fact were senior staff. Uh, then gave instructions to the responsible branches separately, and uh, and and they started to pack their personal belongings and left the post office. And uh, according to uh, the situation, and 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 at that time, that the post office were in normal operation between eight uh, to ten a.m. And, and some branch offices were still in operation between 10 to noon uh, due to time delay in escalating, escalating down the and implementing instructions. And uh, the other uh, asserted that the post office uh, operations were completely ceased after noon time on 8th of December until reopening on 22nd of January next year. And Mr. Law, uh, after issuing the notifications and in fact he mentioned that he continued to go back to work as usual until 25th when PMG ordered everyone inside GPO uh, had to reach it. He then packed the belongings and prepared to leave and then uh, made some uh, souvenir covers with the day stamp 25th of December. And so during that period uh, we, uh, we 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 we, we, we have recorded uh, se several uh, electronic items. Uh, uh, from the left, uh, we have a registered uh, GPO Hong Kong cover, sending to uh, John Shaw, uh, uh, who, uh, who is a famous collector. And uh, I suppose this is a handbag item, uh, not totally uh, used. And then uh, in the middle, another registered letter uh, on also on the, in the afternoon of the 8th. And, I, uh, and, and, and strangely, the, the registration label uh, was uh, 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 torn away. And the one on the right, uh, in fact, uh, is a sheet uh, with uh, the uh, KG6 definitives, and they were all postmarked uh, 12th of December, 1941. Uh, these, I suppose, uh, were uh, in the uh, John D. Shaw's collection. And uh, the black Christmas postmark, uh, noon time, 25th December 41. And uh, so, uh, in fact, Mr. Law Pat Wei uh, mentioned that he, he has uh, produced two souvenir copies only, but in fact, uh, 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 more than two uh, have been recorded from channels in the market. And also, uh, strangely, um, there exists a few very similar covers nearly identical and uh, uh and as I, I i suppose uh some of you uh, can recognize that uh, uh, those uh, three covers on the bottom uh, are, are loose covers because they look uh, the, the same and, and in fact those are uh, untied uh, covers and just just uh, cancer is just the postman on the block of four but uh the the address was using uh, uh address chops or just some some written characters just the uh, typical Dalu style. Okay, about the low low pathway story. In in fact, um, th there are some discrepancies uh, with, with the facts. Uh, uh, we we have uh, mentioned that the mails were still collected uh, after the eight, and the latest day uh, 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 recorded uh, in fact is eleventh uh, of December, uh, as illustrated. Uh, 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 cover on the right, and, and also uh, uh, Richard has uh, illustrated uh, the same cover in, in color. And uh, uh, in my previous slide, and that, that there is a souvenir, uh, uh, that souvenir covers of piece of stamps uh, made on the 12th of December as well. And uh, also more than two covers of block of falls uh, of date uh, 25th of December have been recorded. So uh, if Mr. Law's story is true. Then I have a few questions. Was there any post office notification to the public about ceasing of the postal operations? And uh, who was collecting, picking up and canceling all those mails collected on the line the 10th and 11th of December, 1941? And who entertained the collectors to produce philatelic souvenirs on the 12th of December? And uh, besides of Mr. Law, who were going back to the GPO as usual until 25th of December. I'm going back to the period, the period of uh, when were the two markings applied. Uh, period number 
free uh, is uh, after the Japanese resumed the postal operations in 1942. That period uh, looks obvious uh, because uh, a few detained couples have been recorded uh, with the Japanese cow moon uh, uh, place them uh, uh, the Japanese way, uh, say uh, 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 1942 in fact, uh, in, in the Japanese uh, uh, calendar is uh, 17 and then uh, February and uh, 10 or 11, and with some Chinese characters uh, indicating the address locations, like this one, I call it the second district. And Qi and Qin Ge, this person uh, has moved, something like that. And uh, of course, um, the retour of incoming uh, uh, transit uh, airmails from China and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Actions uh, were uh, performed uh, uh, in February in 1942, and uh, this illustrated one uh, this is one of them. And with uh, the Canton cancellation trial of December uh, of February, uh, in fact, uh, one day earlier than the record that, that Sam has uh, mentioned. Uh, period. Uh, okay, let's. Uh, investigate uh, uh, again about the third number three. Uh, in fact, um, I found an unfit example. According to uh, Mr. Lockhart Wai, uh, after the start of war on December the 8th, uh, postal operations uh, were basically seized, uh, at least to a large extent, and, and totally stopped a few days later. All postal cars were de dismissed, and no one would do the short sorting and post markings. Uh, and then after the Japanese reopened the post office in 1942, uh, the post office decided to handle the mail stuff inside the PPO and started to shorten and return the mails as far as possible. So uh, uh, period number three uh, uh, seems uh, obvious and uh, possible, but look at this uh, unfit example. If the low surface and retour markings were applied in January or February of 1942, uh, when the post, uh, post offices were opened, reopened again. Then why did the postal clerk sort out this military mail for retour? Uh, I mentioned that most of the false mails uh, uh, are without the, the return address, but I suppose this one is having a return address. And that's why the, uh, someone has applied the local service and retour shop on, on it. And it, uh, the chops were applied in, in, in January, February, uh, when the war has ended and, and the Japanese uh, army has uh, taken over all the uh, military bases and uh, all the uh, Hong Kong military personnel were interned at prisoner war camps. Then why did that uh, postal club uh, uh, intended to return this letter uh, back to the military base? So uh, I would like to go back to period number two, uh, uh, which is uh, between 8th and 25th of December. So uh, if low surface and ritual markets were applied before the end uh, of, of the war, the military bases were still functioning and because the fighting uh, were still going on and uh, the uh, soldiers were, were still uh, fighting with the uh, Japanese, then uh, the attempt or, or the, uh, the intent to return mails to the army or to the soldiers, uh, in fact, the, uh, which, which, which were the standards, uh, makes sense. Uh, like this one, uh, and another uh, false mail with uh, the a return address of Stanley, and uh, uh, there, uh, and notes, uh, low surface and retour markings uh, were applied and uh, an attempt uh, has been made uh, to return to the sender uh, in standing. Okay, then uh, the next question is, who applied the low surface and retour markings if uh, they were applied before uh, the surrender of Hong Kong? Um, as the postal class at the sorting office and the counters were all dismissed, according to Mr. Law Petway, uh, soon after 8th of December, uh, any postal procedure could only be performed by those senior staff 
like uh, Mr. Law himself, who were still hanging around inside the GPO. And I would like to suggest a possible scenario like this. Uh, when the war situation was worsening, those senior staff inside the GPO uh, probably knew that uh, low, uh, no outgo low outgo mail, uh, outgoing mail was possible, and they decided to sort the mails for return. And then uh, mails having returned that just were canceled with the no service chop, uh, which uh, was obtained from the sorting office, I suppose. And the, those mails without return address were uh, left aside or abandoned. Mails market no service were then passed to another person to apply in, to a chop. And uh, that chop should be from the return letter office. And that uh, can possibly explain why the two markings were of different colors because uh, they were at, at different uh, locations and having different impacts and, um, and were applied by different persons. So they, they, they are also of different alignments on the covers. Uh, one more question. When did the retour process uh, take place? After the two markings have been applied, when did the return to send the process uh, 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 take place? And who was picking up the delivery process as local postman was there already? If we assume uh, period number two, uh, 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 which is before 25th of, uh, 25th of December, my opinion uh, is that it is impractical because by the time the two markings were applied, the war situation should be very worse and it was getting more dangerous uh, day by day uh, for anybody walking on the street. And on the other hand, there was no postman. Would the senior staff do the mail delivery job? However, if somehow someone from the GPO carried the sorted mails, uh, sorted out mails and attempted to return to a sender's address, I believe uh, there was high chance of a success because uh, at that time, uh, no one could leave Hong Kong uh, because Hong Kong uh, was, was uh, at, at war. And most return addresses were still valid and, and I suppose the addresses uh, were there. But in fact, most of the mails intended for retour failed to reach the addresses and were brought back to GPO and sub subsequently detained. Why? So uh, let us consider uh, the possibility of the retour process uh, taking place after the war. And uh, in fact, uh, marks on some covers uh, hint that uh, the retour process have been taking place after the war, but unsuccessful uh, because uh, uh, you can see some uh, Chinese characters, instructional characters, and like uh, 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 Chin uh, moved or Mopat Tao and unable to deliver. Like this one, I circled in red a Chin and then uh, this one on the right, uh, I circled the characters Mopat Tao Dai, which means unable to deliver. So, uh, 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 in fact, uh, there are more uh, 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 instructions, uh, like uh, uh, as, as uh, 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 Richard uh, has mentioned, uh, like uh, the when you saw the Japanese army camp, uh, that called district one, or one by kid with the business calls uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the instructional mark. I think uh, the, the results or, 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 or the instructions uh, are written by the post, uh, postal club is consistent with the situation at that time when the Japanese implemented military administration over Hong Kong. And when a lot of people were forced to leave Hong Kong and business entities or organizations were closed. Then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a few covers uh, with low surface and retour, but not detained. Uh, a few covers have been recorded with the postmark dated after the departure of the last flight or ship out of Hong Kong. As they were having a clear return address, low surface and retour markings were applied. However, they do not bear the detained mark, like this one. 
December the 6th. And uh, yeah, obviously it missed uh, the, the, 20, uh, the 30th of November flight uh, to uh, the Trans Pacific flight. But uh, there is low detained chop on this cover. Was the detained mark in advertently missed or the mail successfully returned? And uh, that mail I just illustrated uh, from Old Keys and Comedy at National Bank Building, and in fact, uh, its address was Ice House Street. I believe it was returned successfully because it is not uh, an odd case that the detained mark was in Everton's new list. Two other mails from W.R. Lossley have been recorded also without the detained mark, but with no surface and tour. And uh, the address uh, of uh, W.R. Lossley Company, uh, in fact, was at York Building, Chatter Road. This is the first one posted on 29th of November uh, to Puerto Rico um, with no surface and tour, but without the detained mark. This one, also from WRL and Loxley, a post on 5th of December, also with low self and tour, but without the detained mark. So uh, my opinion, um, I need to say that uh, the followings are not conclusive, uh, just propositions uh, based uh, on my research so far. I opined uh, that low surface and retour were applied by some senior staff inside the GPO after uh, in the period between 8th and 25th of December. And I tend to believe uh, that date of period uh, uh, was closer to the Black Christmas Day when the chance of winning the war was dim. So they decided to retour. And the retour action uh, must have taken place after Japanese mission postal operations in 1942. And uh, except for returning uh, those uh, uh, U-turn or incoming transit mails back to Canton, uh, the return of Hong Kong or originating mails were unsuccessful in most cases, and they were ended up detained until the end of the Japanese occupation. Um, those few mails with low surface and return, but without the detaining mark, have been recorded. But they uh, and they were successfully returned, but there are still questions. When were they returned? If uh, between if and December, then by whom and how? And uh, I do not have any uh, uh, concrete answer at this stage. And so, a uh, uh, work in progress and more homework uh, need to be done. And uh, yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, yes, again, everybody has to do a lot of homework. Uh, yeah, I think it is a, is, a, is a fantastic presentation again. And tonight we have three really good presentations. Uh, but before we leave, uh, anybody want to ask any questions uh, about Simon's presentation? In fact, Simon has answered my earlier question to Richard. There, there are, in fact, some cover which have been delivered without the um, data and marking. So there are several of them. That's, that's quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Simon, I actually have one that was supposed to be service mail December the 5th or 7th. <laughs> that didn't have any detail marking. I'll send that to you later. Oh, okay, thank you. It was supposed, you know, it's not, it's not Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So I have a theory because I think it got stuck in, in front of another cover because there is part of the front cover that was still here. So- Oh, oh, oh Sam, may, I, yeah. I, I don't know which cover you had mentioned. Yeah, um, I have you, it, yeah. you You illustrate it in, in your- Yes, uh, yes. I think it's a bit in safe, yes. right? Yes, and yes. in fact, uh, I believe that cover uh, uh, was successfully uh, delivered to UK uh, uh, by the last uh, mail, service mail, uh, the, the, the ship on the 5th, uh, departing Hong Kong on the 5th of December. 
Oh, I'll, okay. I'll the same. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Which ship was that? Uh, the, the last mail out of Hong Kong, the surface mail. Because so there exists a few covers uh, with a postmark 5th of December, uh, uh, which were successfully uh, 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 departed from Hong Kong and uh, arrived at uh, uh, London or, or UK in, in January or February 42. I, I, I. In fact, I, 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 I have one uh, such cover. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to ask a question uh, to either Simon or Richard, uh, mentioning the, the different colors of the detained hand stamp. Um, you know, one, one for the black and the other for the purple. Um, would it be actually possible to have actually two uh, post office staff actually um, using those chops? You know, one uh, primarily for the, the US mail and the other for the rest of the world. So that uh, you know they they actually doing think their jobs simultaneously rather than uh, one after the other. Sure, sure. Is is that very, very interesting? That uh, those looks like uh, rubber chops, right? Would there be any sort of a, a differences um, between the chops? You know, have you actually uh, superimposed those two together and see whether they're exactly the same or there's slight differences? That would be interesting because in the in the China Mail article I mentioned, mm. uh, it said that they were wooden chop. Wooden chop, okay, fair enough. But still, it's that, wooden chop. That, that, that article was quite inaccurate. So <laughs> yes, but either which, I mean, e even if it's a steel chop, I mean, there still could be some some minor uh, 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 differences. I mean, Simon is very good at uh, uh, doing all these computer tricks. So. <laughs> <laughs> of comparing the chops. Uh, just wonder whether you, you have tried that you superimpose those two images together and see. Uh, see no, no not, not yet for the detainer chop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I think you. you but, Andrew, but just visually, mm. the black chops usually are much thicker, mm. especially on the, the frames. Take a look at those. Yeah. The yeah. purple ink. Maybe it's not just because of that, it's just the consistency of the ink. Well, mm -hmm. I used to work in ink. Sure. So the, the purple are usually much finer. Mm. So, sure. you know, that's one observation anyway, visually. Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, so we still haven't figured out whether they're rubber or wood or, uh, what, or whatever material. I think they made them rubber because um, sometimes you, you see those chops which are a little bit uh, sort of a, 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 a bent uh, at, the, at some times. On some covers, they are not, you know, crisp clear. So if it's a wooden chop, it shouldn't really select like a curve like that. Anyhow, it's for you guys to study. <laughs> this is not really my collecting area. Anyhow. Um, Anybody got any questions for, you know, all three presenters? No? Right, okay. So uh, I think before we go, I'd like to uh, make an uh, advertising uh, for our, our journal. This is our, our, can you see it? Yes, this is the, the latest journal, which is the 399. Uh, it's being printed at the moment. Yes, can you see it? Yeah, right, okay. It's being printed at the moment. This is just the uh, proof, well, not, not quite proof reading, but this is the, actually the, the, the copy that I've got uh, just, just to make sure there's not, nothing is uh, incorrect. And uh, of course, inside this is the most important part, which is the subscription. So uh, you can see the subscription. You haven't actually paid a subscription. Uh, you better pay it ASAP, otherwise the treasurer would be panicking about the finances. <laughs> Anyhow, um, okay, yeah, I think uh, I'll probably send these out um, uh, maybe on Saturday or uh, maybe Monday or Tuesday next week. Uh, apologies for the delay because of the typhoon. We had a double typhoon last week 
which unfortunately Nick sent me the, uh, the, the file of the, uh, the, the study circle journal, which I couldn't do nothing about it. So, uh, so it's definitely gone to the printers and then uh, probably come back on Saturday. And so I'll do the, the, the necessary work uh, during the weekend and put them more into the mail on Monday or Tuesday. Okay, so, and now the, the air mail to the UK has resumed. So I think uh, probably it will be about maybe 10, 10 days. It's still a bit of delay because of reduced flights. So I guess uh, maybe like 10, 14 days for them to reach the UK and probably maybe 14 days or maybe 20 days to reach Canada and US. So, uh, all right, okay. So we'll look forward to it. I mean, it's, it's a, again, it's a very nice uh, uh, a journal produced by um, uh, Nick. And uh, as you know, it's 399. The next one is 400, which is, uh, 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 you know, like a, le like a uh, you know, like, like a, you know, it's a round number, you know, like a landmark. So I think Nick would ask uh, you and all of you to write some article to make it a bumper issue. Okay. So anyway, uh, any other issues that, uh, or any other, any, any other comments you would like to make um, about um, you know, anything? I know I've, I, I, Harman's got a question for me. I received his email, but I'll, I'll answer you by email rather than, <laughs> because I think it'll probably take another, another 15 minutes to, to do so. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I did receive that email. I was actually thinking about that, uh, how, how, to, how to answer you. Uh, anyway, okay. So um, if there's no more questions, I think we'll call it uh, a day or an evening. And um, it's good to see you all. And we look forward to another session of the of um, of the same same theme, the Japanese occupation, or you know anything. Maybe maybe uh, uh, Sam could also talk about C force or whatever <laughs> you can think of related to the <laughs> you no know, to to the. To I think the, the people are tired of hearing C force. <laughs> yes, if, if they want. If they, I yes. believe uh, John John can talk about uh, uh, rescue flight and uh, last mails and uh, several more topics. <laughs> yes, I, I'm sure that, that there's still a lot to be discussed. So maybe uh, I'll see you guys next month um, and you know, have a have a nice uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, and uh, good night from Hong Kong. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.